Let's go ahead and see if we can get a good feel for who's out in the audience. So go ahead and pick up your clicker. Uh, for those of you that have not used these before, it's really that last response that you enter in this system. So if you accidentally hit A, but A, I meant to hit B, it's that B that's recorded in. So go ahead and fill this out. I think, Todd, at one point, we had, what, 170-something in the room. We probably lost a few people, so let's see where we're at. And it looks like we're somewhere, if you look at the top, you can see the number of responses that have gone in. It looks like we're at 130 something. So I'll close this out now. And we got here 50% in the room indicating that thought. I think that's our highest by far and away of all the different uh, locations. I think prior to this, it must have been somewhere around 40% or so. So about half of you in the audience indicate you're into that first category. Okay, let me make just a few comments about what has been a pretty common practice over the last four or five years throughout, not just Illinois, but across much of the Corn Belt, and that's this application of fungicide slash insecticide a tank mixes to both corn and soybean acres. Let me make just a few comments about them because it plays into the results that I'll share with you in just a second regarding our surveys that we took around the state. If you really begin to look at what type of products are being sprayed, you can really break it down pretty conveniently and easily into these two categories of insecticides, neonicotinoids, and pyrethroids. And of course, in many cases, we're also seeing a fungicide added in. Carl spoke extensively about that a little bit earlier. Now, with regard to the neonicotinoids, when do we most commonly think of neonicotinoids today? Insecticidal seed trees. I heard several of you say that. The insecticidal seed tree, which products like Cruiser, by the Foxan, Poncho, Clifianidin, but there are some other uh, neonicotinoids out there as well, like imidacloprid. And as you glance down through this list, you see some of those products showing up. Here's imidacloprid that I mentioned as well. That's a neonicotinoid. Obviously, many of these are pyrethroids. So very, very common applications. And I'll share with you a little bit later in the presentation some efficacy data as well as yield data, because I think as you move forward, going back to some of the comments that Gary Schmidt made, your decisions regarding inputs this year are going to be certainly much more important moving forward when we see this trend towards you know uh, less favorable commodity prices that uh, Gary talked about. Let me ask this question: Did you or someone else apply techniques? of this insecticide, any insecticide, fungicide combination to soybeans in 2013. Did you or someone else? 58%. 58 percent of that pretty much falls in line with what I'm seeing in other areas of the state as well. Let's go on to the next question. Did you or someone else apply tag mix now instead of Soybeans, now we're looking at corn, and again, we're looking at this combination. 51%. So, you know, when I look at information like this, whether at this location or the other five locations, it's pretty easy to see that we're, you know, this is a very common practice, and it's been very common for, for many years now. Now, here's a question for you to think about. If you answered yes, if you're that 58%, the soybeans said yes, you or someone else sprayed with a tank mix of an insecticide or fungicide, or that 51% that indicated yes in corn. Did you scout those fields and use a threshold? You know, Carl indicated his data supports the use of fungicides for the most part when you actually have a disease present out in the field. Did you go out and scout? Maybe you were looking for defoliation. That's why you chose to put an insecticide in. Did you hire someone to go out and scout and make that recommendation to you? Or C, 
Uh, no scouting. I used an insurance approach basically. And this was very common certainly when we had higher prices. And 46% fall into this category C. Um, 40% scouted fields and thresholds. Again, as we move forward into 2014, uh, this idea of using an insurance based approach particularly in corn, maybe you're going to think some of those decisions through a bit more carefully, so that would be, that would be my hope. Now, switch gears for just a second, then I'll come back to some of those results. One of the insects that we were looking for in our statewide surveys was this insect, the brown marmorated stink bug. You are all very familiar with brown and green stink bugs. You've seen them in corn, you've seen them in soybeans for years. This one is new, uh, and it's becoming, uh, I think, more problematic as we move forward. Uh, it came into the U.S. Uh, back in the late 1990s on infest infested shipping crates from China. It's now very common across the mid-Atlantic states. It has continued to move towards the west. You can see the number of counties now in the state where we've had positive confirmations for this particular uh, insect. You can see we've had certainly last year quite a few counties added to this list. Now, this insect's a very aggressive feeder, like state bugs. They have needle-like mouth parts, piercing, sucking mouth parts. They have a very wide host range. They can feed on a lot of fruits and a lot of vegetables, but they also can be a problem in soybeans. These are some photos taken by some entomologists out of Virginia Tech, University of Maryland, University of Delaware, showing you what injury to soybean pods uh, looks like when you have brown marmorated stink bugs out in those fields. You can see what the damaged beans look like, these black spots, some of the shriveling that takes place on these seeds, the stain that can occur. Uh, they can be very, very significant problems. Also in corn, unlike a lot of stink bugs that you're familiar with, uh, most of the ones in Illinois would have great difficulty piercing the husk of an ear, but not these, not these stink bugs. They can use those needle-like mouth parts to directly go through the husk and create this kind of injury that you see. And notice all the stink bugs gathered on that husk. We have both the adults as well as the immatures. The immatures basically uh, are just smaller versions of the adults with black, black wings. And this just shows you some examples of what they can do to uh, sweet corn as well. So uh, again, pay attention. Uh, this is an insect that we're going to see a lot more of, unfortunately, in years to come. Now, an insect that you're more familiar with would be the Japanese beetle. And you know the Japanese beetle can not only cause defoliation like this that you see in soybeans, but also can clip silks, can interfere with pollination, reduce curl sap. Uh, but what kind of year did we have last year for Japanese beetles? Would you say that was a pretty significant year or kind of a down year for Japanese beetles? More of a down year, that's, that's right. Anybody recall offhand what kind of threshold you would utilize for Japanese beetles and soybeans? 30%, and you see about 30% defoliation prior to bloom. If you're in that bloom to pod fill period, about 20% defoliation. As far as clipping of silks, that threshold would be, you know, if you've got about half an inch of silk still protruding out of that ear tip, usually somewhere around three Japanese beetles per plant, then we begin to think about the potential for rescue treatments. You have these maps in your proceedings. This first map of the state shows you what the Japanese beetle densities look like for various counties around the state. Uh, we went into five soybean fields at random in each of those counties. Within each of those five soybean fields selected at random, we took 100 sweeps. So these represent numbers of beetles per 100 sweeps for those five soybean fields. Uh, this would be basically the first week in August, and this map over here 
and again, details are in the proceedings that that other map would reflect mid August. So we kind of get a sense whether the densities were going up or down across a broad section of the state. I'd say the southern two thirds of Illinois, the overall densities were very, very low. And it was really only up here in the northwestern areas of the state where we had Japanese beetles that reached any kind of threatening levels. So my question would be, again, going back to how commonly a lot of these insecticide applications, those tank mixes that we talked about earlier, I have to wonder, kind of scratch my head, how many of those were really, you know, of economic benefit. In fact, this was one of our trials up near Morrison. So we're up in the northern, northwestern part of the state. You can see the list of products in this particular experiment. It was a randomized complete block, four replications in this particular study. You can see our different products. Our check is that last line that you see on this particular table. Treatments were applied on 25 July. That's uh, zero day after treatment. You can see what the densities were. As you would guess, no statistical separation on that day, as you would expect. And then we go one week after treatment, or seven days after treatment, two weeks, and then three weeks after treatment. And you can see there are a number of products that help those Japanese beetle densities very nicely. They were statistically lower than the untreated check. But when you get through over here in this column, which is the most important column, that's the yield, there's really no statistical separation for any of those treatments as compared to the entry to check. Basically, we were in the low 60 to this mid 60 bushel per acre range. So, key point here, even though you may go out into a field, and we know Japanese beetles do tend to congregate near field edges or border rows. And you might even see what you think are pretty impressive densities, but unless that threshold is reached, in many cases, you're not going to see any significant economic benefit to applying that treatment. So my, my guess, certainly this was the case in this trial, but I'm guessing in a lot of your fields as well that were treated, probably no significant economic return in many cases for this particular insect. Bean leaf beetle. Now this is considered to be, again, another pretty important insect pest from time to time out in soybean fields. Bean leaf beetles, we have a red form as well as a form here that's more tan. Some have spots on their wing covers, others do not. But when I look at these numbers, and again, this, these are averages per 100 sweeps. Look how very low these numbers are. Okay, even those in red are still very, very low numbers per 100 sweeps. So again, I ask, especially as you move forward into this growing season, really be careful about making those decisions to apply some of these inputs to fields. My guess is the numbers are gonna be very low, particularly with regard to being leaf beetles. This is an insect that overwinters as an adult in this stage. And eat leaf litter in protected areas or wood areas. When we start to get temperatures in spring, say above 50 degrees Fahrenheit, those bean leaf beetles will move out of those protected areas. Initially, they like to seek out alfalfa stands, and as the first soybean fields begin to emerge, they will move into the soybean fields. But this winter is going to be very, very tough on bean leaf beetle populations. Going back to Japanese beetle. If the Japanese beetle has a weak link, and it doesn't have any, it's cold winters. And when you get soil that's frozen 18 inches or below in some cases, the overwintering rub mortality of Japanese beetles is going to be quite high. So I'm anticipating lower numbers of Japanese beetles as we move forward into 2014 as well. So that's good news. Let's spend just a few minutes looking at Western corn rootworm. I told you I did kind of an update where we stand on some of these issues with regard to BT performance. This was uh, an interesting list that I kind of compiled.
from this publication. You can see my source, for BBC News. And if you go clear to the bottom of this particular set of bullets, you can see that the Western Corn Rootworm, which you're all very familiar with, was categorized as the most expensive pest to control. That's worldwide. In terms of dollars spent on insecticide, dollars spent on additional seed costs, primarily BTC, as well as losses caused by Western corn root. Now we know Western corn root was not only a problem in the U.S. in the corn producing regions, but since the early 90s, so for about 20 years now, a pretty significant problem in some areas of Europe as well, and China so far. No Western corn rootworm. This is an insect that they are very, very leery of and do not want. Economic impact, BT corn. This is a very valuable tool. Very valuable tool. Industry, going back to 2003, delivered, as you can see here, what, about 10 years ago, the first set of BT hybrids that came into the marketplace for corn rootworm. We can go all the way back to 1996. When BT hybrids came into the marketplace for European corn borer. But it wasn't until about seven years later they came into the marketplace uh, for corn rootworm. Primary economic impact? Greater yields. If you look at all the data across the U.S., in general we see about a 5% yield advantage for using a BT rootworm hybrid compared to non BT rootworm hybrids. Net economic impact? somewhere between $10 to $50 per acre, depending upon the level of rootworm that you have out there. Last year, this conference, I indicated that for every one node of roots destroyed by Western corn rootworm, you get back about 15% yield. Right? One node of roots destroyed, 15% yield loss. A pretty significant economic impact. Cumulative benefit from BT corn, since 03, over this last decade, this is for the U.S., about $7 billion. A tremendous tool at our disposal for use. That's why there's so much concern about where this technology may be, may be headed. If you take a look at Western corn rootworm densities, and again, these maps are in the proceedings, uh, these are numbers of beetles per plant. Again, the first week in August, and this map on this side would be basically mid-August. Now, how many beetles, if you're in a corn-following corn or a continuous corn production system, how many beetles per plant should we begin to become a bit concerned that the following year we may have some economic issues? Usually about three-quarters of a beetle per plant. Three-quarters to one beetle per plant, continuous corn, Odds are you may have some economic issues to follow the growing season. And some of these numbers would suggest, particularly through East Central Illinois in early August, even into mid August, some of these areas up in northwestern Illinois. But for a good cross section of the state, particularly the southern third of the state, very low numbers of western corn rural adults in these cornfields. And again, these are averages for five fields in each of the counties. So I have to ask the question, why, why are we planting so much BT or corn in this area of the state? These are regional averages, and you can see that whether it's the sampling period one or two, early August or mid-August, most areas of the state have pretty low numbers of western corn at worms, particularly southeastern, southwestern, to some extent, west central Illinois. These represent, by the way, this is a western corn at female. She's had her abdomen squeezed, and you can see the individual eggs coming out of her abdomen. How many, how many eggs can a western corn at worm female lay? How many does she deposit out there? Usually somewhere between three to 400 of these eggs. So she's very, very prolific in spreading her progeny. Now, we know that western corn rootworms, unfortunately, don't just show up in corn. We know they can be out in soybean fields as well. And that's been the case in Illinois now for about 20 years with this rotation-resistant western corn rootworm. So we wanted to get a good handle on how many of these adults are showing up out there in our soybean fields. 
And then again, if we look at the first part of August, uh, not very many Westerns showing up uh, out in soybean fields, at least in large numbers. As we get into middle of August, look at these numbers over here and across central and I guess east central to some extent, northeastern Illinois, those numbers begin to creep up a bit and cause me some concern. And as it turns out, this is an area where we know we've had quite a few issues with BT, at least some BT hybrids, uh, like BT Triple Pro, those expressing that cry 3 bb one protein, we've had a lot of issues with performance or lack thereof up in this area of the state. Now what made that so unusual were these were first year cornfields. These were rotated cornfields where those hybrids had been planted. A lot of information on this particular chart, and I'm trying to get through it pretty quickly, but this just shows you some insecticides, insecticide-fungicide combinations. These were uh, treatments applied to soybeans up in DeKalb. Here's our untreated check here at the bottom. I want you to really focus in primarily on corn rootworms. We had uh, our first treatment applied on the 8th of August. And then you can see the other the days after treatment. But of particular interest, I think, as we get into later August, look how these numbers really began to jump up out there in soybeans. Again, it causing me some concern as we got into later August. We were seeing a lot of western corn rootworms out of these soybean fields. And in fact, a lot of growers around that part of the state where you saw some of those numbers uh, in northeastern Illinois, east central Illinois, north central Illinois. A lot of growers said, I, I saw lots and lots of beetles well into September this year, much later in the season than I've ever seen them before. And we know that, to some extent, there may be some environmental issues going on there. But we also know that we plant a lot of BT corn. And with BT corn, there's no question about it, we do tend to get a lot more later emergence, delayed feeding, and so this is becoming more and more common uh, through the years. Hey, Dr. Clares, again, did you or do you intend to purchase a BT hybrid that provides corn rootworm protection in 2014? So if you made your purchase already um, regarding a BT hybrid, Specifically, one that would provide you with corn rootworm protection. 92%, very high, and that has been consistently high now for a number of years, not surprisingly. If you answered yes to this question, is the BT hybrid a pyramided product? Is it a pyramided product? Now, by a pyramided product, one that expresses not just one cry protein, aimed at corn rootworms, but two cry proteins aimed at Western corn. 76% indicating use of a pyramid. Now, what's one of the chief advantages of using a pyramid BT product? The refuge has been reduced, right, in many cases. In some cases, a 5%. Refuge in a bag or seedless, so that's, a, that's an advantage. You don't have to mess around with the structured refuge anymore. It makes it simple. Is it a better overall resistance management strategy for corn rootworm to use a seed blend? The answer is yes, it is for corn rootworm. For corn rootworm, that's still, I think, an open, open question. So, where is the industry going? Obviously in the direction of these seed blends in a very, very significant way. Now, which of the following statement best explains why you intend to plant a BT hybrid that offers corn rootworm protection? So if you answered yes, all right, 60% primarily would fall into this category here. And this category B continues to come up uh, over and over as a pretty high contender in many many locations. Farmers indicating that they're still a little bit frustrated here with access to non-BT hybrids. We know you've heard me talk about, and I share some of these photos from time to time, 
we know that we've had some pretty significant damage going back all the way to August 2011, the damage to BT hybrids expressing this cry 3 bb one protein up in areas of the state like Whiteside County, Henry County, this just shows you some severe lodging that took place going back to 2011. Again, where we saw some of this damage showing up over and over again, it was in continuous corn. It was where we had non-rotation of trace, and the same held true for many areas where resistance was reported in Iowa. And this just shows you for Whiteside and Henry County, in cooperation with Iowa State University, where we did some plant-based bioassays. Uh, when we looked at control populations, whether it was cry 3 bb one or whether it was Herculex, both of those product lines were still performing very well, whether it was 3 bb one or 34-35-AB1. But when we ran the bioassays from larvae produced from adults collected in problem fields in Whiteside and Henry County, even though Herculex still provided very acceptable levels of control, that was not the case for BT or BT Triple Pro that expresses the cry 3 bb one So this was working in cooperation with, with Iowa State. Um, and by the way, I should point out that uh, that researcher, Aaron Gaston, recently reported at our national entomology meetings in Austin, Texas in November that there's a pretty high level in many areas right now of cross resistance between that cry 3 bb one protein and the modified cry 3 a protein that's expressed in agri-shooters. And that's, that's a pretty big concern right now. Now we know we've got this crop rotation resistance strain. It had its origin here in Fort County going back over 20 years ago. It has spread across many areas of the corn belt. And this just shows you what some rootworm injury looked like. In this case, Livingston County. Now this was a photo taken on August the 26th. These are VT Triple Pro roots. Uh, the tissue was uh, checked to make sure that that particular protein was being expressed, and it was. But we had severe lodging, severe damage. And again, this was in rotated corn. And in fact, here's sort of the same situation. Now we're looking at some roots from Kankakee County, rotated corn, and the cry 3 bb one protein not working very well. This is unique. Uh, we've not seen this kind of report today where we had failure of this particular protein in rotated corn. Joe Spencer and I went up to these fields, we collected adults from both corn and soybean fields. The appropriate plant bioassays are being uh, conducted. We'll have the results sometime in the next few months, hopefully. But certainly, uh, the prospect that seems very real that we not only have, at least for the segment of the rootworm population, a resistant strain to describe 3 bb one protein, but also to this crop rotation. Very unfortunate. Have we seen resistance develop to the rapidly increasing use of planting time soil insecticides? The answer is no, we, we've not. And that's primarily because they're put out, these insecticides, either liquids or granules, in a band or in furrow at planting time. And this just shows you the adult emergence cage that we use in our plots to look at adult emergence. And because we're not treating the centers of these uh, rows uh, with these insecticides, in a sense we've had a refuge out there for decades. So that's, that's good news. We've not had resistance developed to these products. This just shows you the results uh, that I think verifies how popular these soil insecticides are becoming. These were the results last year from 2013 for in soybean classics. For instance, here we were in Champaign, we had 140 responses, about 45% indicating that they were going to use both a BT hybrid for rootworms and a soil insecticide. You can see what our overall average percentage was for the state. I remember when these BT rootworm hybrids came to the marketplace 10 years ago, what was the number one selling feature touted for these products? We're going to move away from insecticides. We're not going to have to use soil insecticides. And we're really seeing some sharp reversals 
on that in recent years, unfortunately. Now, if we look at this particular table, table two, this is not in your proceedings, but I should point out, if you go online and type in on target University of Illinois, you can see not only this particular set of results, but we have other trials, uh, both corn and soybeans, and you can go all the way back to 2004 and, and look at a variety of different insecticides, corn and soybeans, and BT products. But when I look at this particular uh, data set here, and here we have our untreated, our check there at the bottom, and this was an experiment looking at the addition of force on top of BT hybrids uh, for decal. And you can pick out your, your treatment that you might be interested in. So for instance, if you take 95% of the smart stacks, and we have the 5% seed blend, uh, you can see what the root rating was, very low uh, root injury. You can check out our yields. You can add force, as we did, to that particular treatment, and no statistical separation when it comes to yield. And that held true for those other uh, comparisons in this particular table. And again, you can go to that on-target website, you can really tease apart a number of different trials and look at specific treatments of interest to you. But the bottom line is, and this was a paper published in the Journal of Economic Entomology late last year, the bottom line from this study, it was a multi-state uh, study, University of Nebraska, University of Illinois, Iowa State University, and the results from that particular research was, you know what, when you add a soil insecticide to an BT hybrid, we did not see any improvement in root protection, we did not see any improvement in yield, and in terms of a resistance management strategy, quite honestly, it was really kind of negative. And that's reported in this particular, this peer-reviewed journal article. So, am I saying that you should never use a soil insecticide if you plant a BT root on hybrid? No, I'm not saying that. Let's say you're one of those producers up in Kankakee County or Livingston County and you want to use one of those single traded hybrids up there that failed last year. Do I think you should use a soil insecticide if you want to go back with one of those hybrids? Yes. Because that's going to be your mainstay root protection, that soil insecticide. What if you've got a field that perhaps needed some sort of long term? conservation program, you're going to go back in and plant a BT hybrid, but I think you should use the soil insecticide in that situation. Yes, I think you may have some white grub or wireworm issues. Do I think you need to use soil insecticide with, and it looks like the majority of you are using those pyramided BT hybrids? The answer is no. If you're using a pyramided BT rubrum hybrid, you should be just fine whether it's University of Illinois data that I look at, or other land grant university data. So those purely BT hybrids, they should provide enough root room protection you don't need to sell the sex side. A single trait, particularly where that trait has failed, that's a different story. Okay, so I want to be clear on that point. Question, do you intend to use the soil insecticide? I realize this is a bit like asking the leading question in a trial case here. Right? Hopefully I'll just convince you that in most cases you don't, but give me your honest response here. Do you intend to use the planting time soil insecticide with your root work ET hybrid in 2014? 41%. So still pretty pretty high. If you said yes, if you answered yes to that question, can you give me a sense for why you intend to go in that direction. Okay, a lot of concern out there over this resistance issue, followed by secondary soil insects still. One in five out there still consider this to be overall cheap insurance. Okay. Well, that's my last, last slide. Um, I wanted to put this up here because I want to remind everybody how important IPM is as integrated whether it was Carl talking about fungicide resistance or Adam Davis or Aaron Hader talking about herbicide resistance or me sharing with you some of my concerns about BP resistance. Unless we integrate our management tools more effectively, we're going to continue to hear more and more about these resistance issues across the farm field, whether it's pathology, entomology, or weed science. So let me stop there.
Again, thanks to all of you for coming out. We really appreciate it. And I hope the rest of your day goes well. Thank you very much.